Hi, uh, I'm Art Horwich from Yale School of Medicine. Uh, I want to describe a, one of the experiments that we've carried out uh, over the years to try to understand how chaperonins mediate protein folding. Uh, and today, in this particular uh, segment, I want to discuss experiments that we carried out that uh, get at the role of ATP, essential for chaperonin-mediated folding, uh, the binding and hydrolysis of ATP by the GROW-EL machine and how that uh, drives the chaperonin cycle. So um, the questions that I want to raise uh, are shown here. Uh, what does ATP do is the first sort of fundamental question. There was some history coming into our experiments. It was known from early experiments that ATP binding was required in the seven subunits of a ring uh, to recruit GROW-ES to a ring to bind it and encapsulate uh, that particular ring. It was also known from early on from work of Yufrach and Horowitz at the Weizmann Institute that um, there is binding of ATP cooperatively within a GROW-EL ring but anti or negatively uh, cooperative between rings such that at any given time uh, GROW-EL is occupied with ATP on one ring, but it does not have nucleotide uh, present on the opposite ring. Uh, thus, GROW-ES can only bind to a ring that is occupied with ATP, and this produces an inherent asymmetry uh, of the uh, chaperone and co-chaperone and complex, uh, with GROW-ES typically binding to only one GROW-EL ring at a time. So I'd like also to take up the issue of when is binding required and when is hydrolysis required. It turns out that there are distinct actions of binding and hydrolysis. So, and last but not least, I wanna acknowledge the experimentalists who are involved with this work. Uh, Hayes Rai, who was a postdoc in the lab at that point, Charu Chaudhry, a student shared with the Paul Sigler group, and Steve Burston, who is a postdoc in the lab. So first I'll talk about um, the GROW-ES bound ring and the behavior of ATP in this uh, so-called cis ring. Uh, and so um, I should first uh, point out a little bit of, of the uh, geometry uh, and architecture of a cis complex, an asymmetric GROW-ES, GROW-EL complex. So here you see GROW-ES bound to the top of a GROW-EL ring. Uh, and the point is that it's uh, a nucleotide occupied ring. And the point further is that at the nucleotide pocket, there is a stereochemistry that gives us some uh, pointers on where uh, mutagenesis uh, and structure function studies would be uh, most informative. So it turns out that when uh, ATP is bound in the pocket, and here this is an actually ADP aluminum fluoride complex that was co-crystallized uh, with GROW-EL, GROW-ES, and produces an asymmetric complex. Here is where you see effectively the gamma phosphate, which is an ALF3 complex. You see the magnesium uh, cation that is present also in the ADP state of GROW-EL, but you see now here also, crucially, a uh, residue from the intermediate domain of GROW-EL that is essentially swung down into the nucleotide pocket. Uh, the residue is ASP398, aspartate-398, and basically this acidic residue is going to activate a water which is not shown very well in electron density, and so I'll just point to where it would be with my finger. Uh, between ASP398 and uh, ASP52, uh, there would be uh, the activation of that water um, to hydrolyze the uh, gamma phosphate more or less off, off of a, an ATP. Uh, and so uh, if one changes ASP398 to an alanine, uh, GROW-EL can very efficiently bind ATP with uh, more or less the same affinity uh, as the wild type molecule. But the mutant molecule fails to hydrolyze, as expected, uh, ATP with a reduced rate, uh, reduced to the level of about 2% of wild type. So effectively, hydrolysis is, is, is substantially uh, blocked or, or slowed to a very slow rate. So with that stereochemistry in mind, uh, we've used the ASP398 mutation. Um, to assess uh, functions both in the cis ring and trans ring of GROW-EL. 
Uh, and so um, the first observation we could make is that ATP binding alone in the absence of hydrolysis due to this D398A mutation is sufficient to trigger productive folding. And so this was an experiment carried out with a single ring version of GROW-EL uh, that I'll describe in a little bit more detail in um, a few slides. Um, but it essentially has mutations at the equatorial uh, aspect of, of a GROW-EL ring that prevent uh, the two rings from normally associating. And so this single ring version of GROW-EL that also contains a D398A mutation can effectively bind ATP and thus move its apical domains and bind GROW-ES uh, and effectively form a folding chamber uh, in which a polypeptide um, could uh, be released and folded uh, in the absence here because of this mutation of ATP hydrolysis. And so ATP binding to SR398 is sufficient to trigger uh, productive folding of uh, a pyronated rubisco, but also of substrates like rhodonese that are monomeric substrates that can be assayed directly uh, for their recovery of enzyme activity while they're in this 400 kd complex uh, and so it, it, these uh, items of data indicate that atp binding in the absence of hydrolysis is sufficient to trigger productive folding so this i would say is the minimal folding active version of the grow el grow es uh, chaperonin system uh, and so here's, you're seeing just a little bit of this data in real time from the Rubisco experiment. Uh, what we're watching here is fluorescence anisotropy uh, as shown in this uh, top panel. Uh, and you can see that either wild type grow EL uh, ESATP or an SR1 grow ESATP uh, trigger a, um, uh, in, upon addition of ATP, a rapid drop in the uh, anisotropy of a substrate Rubisco followed by a slow rise. So that corresponds, that slow rise, to the recovery of Rubisco enzyme activity uh, in a complete folding reaction. Um, note in the bottom panels here, though, that in the presence of ADP, or not the non-hydrolyzable analog AMP-PNP, no such uh, fluorescence changes occur. And uh, to our understanding, the polypeptide remains stuck to the apical domains of GROW-EL, uh, unable to, uh, with release unable to be triggered uh, absent uh, the gamma phosphate of ATP. So, and here, just to, to add to this, you see uh, SR398 that I mentioned a couple slides ago, uh, the single ring version that cannot hydrolyze ATP despite being able to bind it efficiently. It binds GROW-ES efficiently and it forms an encapsulated chamber, and indeed SR398 produces a fluorescent uh, anisotropy change that has the same rise that we see with the wild-type complex or with SR1. Um, that it uh, corresponds to refolding of Rubisco inside the folding chamber. And once again, the presence of non-hydrolyzable analog like AMP, PNP, does not support the kinds of fluorescent anisotropy changes, or in the case of rhodonese activity changes, that correspond to production of the native state. So the gamma phosphate of ATP and ATP itself are crucial in the cis ring to triggering productive release of polypeptide from the walls of the uh, from the GROW-EL cavity walls into what is um, a cis folding chamber. Okay, so in fact, we've been able to do experiments where we add the, effectively the gamma phosphate of ATP as in a separate step. So one first forms a, um, an ADP cis ternary complex. Uh, for example, using rhodonese, one would add rhodonese to SR1 then add ADP and grow ES, and this forms, in fact, an encapsulated complex. But from earlier fluorescence anisotropy experiments, the rhodonese is stuck on the cavity wall. It's never released into the folding chamber. By contrast now, if one adds to this stable complex, aluminum fluoride metal complex over here, effectively all hell breaks loose. The polypeptide is released from the cavity wall, and we now see recovery of rhodonese activity uh, at a rate uh, that corresponds to folding uh, inside SR1 GROW-ES or at, at a wild-type 
Grohl Grohl reaction. So effectively, the addition of that aluminum fluoride complex, and I should say this can also be mimicked with beryllium fluoride, which is a ground state analog as opposed to the transition state analog that AL, um, uh, aluminum fluoride is usually thought of. Either of those is capable of producing uh, a release of the substrate into this uh, folding chamber where productive folding ensues and the native state of rhodonese is produced. Okay, so now having dealt with the um, action of ATP in the cis ring, I'd like to turn to its actions in the trans ring. So this is the ring uh, that is opposite the one bound by GROW-ES. So what does ATP do in that particular ring? Uh, and so to um, carry out these experiments, uh, Hayes Rye and Jonathan Weissman and a number of people in the group used uh, effectively a double ring version of D398A GROW-EL. So again, this is a mutation that allows ATP to bind with normal affinity to the seven subunits of a GROW-EL ring, um, but minimizes the rate of hydrolysis to 2% or less of wild type. So effectively, one could form a cis-ternary complex in which ATP uh, is bound to a GROW-EL ring, and uh, uh, to a substrate bound ring that is, and recruit GROW-ES to encapsulate that substrate. In this case, it's GFP, so we can report on its refolding easily enough by its recovery of fluorescence. Uh, and so now we have a cis-ternary complex with GFP refolded over a period of some minutes inside the cis-folding chamber of D398A. Uh, one then carries out a series of steps in which one removes any GFP that was bound to the opposite ring uh, by treating with uh, a protease, protonase K. Uh, so that removes GFP such that we only have GFP in the cis ring. Uh, one then gel filters this complex to remove any of the added uh, excess ATP that is not bound in this complex. And then one incubates for various periods of time. Now we know that ATP hydrolyzes very slowly in a D398A ring. So we have to wait a while, uh, since it's 2% the normal rate, we have to wait a considerable while before ATP in this ring will be hydrolyzed. But the postulate is that once it hydrolyzes, and this is according to the beautiful experiments of um, uh, of, of uh, Yifrach and Horovitz, that once ATP hydrolyzes in this ring, it will gate entry of ATP into the opposite ring. And since that's a D398A ring, that ATP will not hydrolyze on any uh, short time scale. It'll simply bind and do whatever it's going to do. And so we could ask whether ATP binding in that ring is sufficient to eject all the ligands from the cis ring. So there had been experiments published in 94 or so by George Lormer and his co-workers that suggested that the action of ATP, they thought it was hydrolysis, but it turns out to really be binding, the action of ATP in the trans ring could eject uh, GROW-ES and the ligands from the cis ring. And here was a further test of that model uh, using D398A. And so what we saw was that at short times, so this is a, gel filtrate, a series of gel filtration runs that you see laid out here, at short times you see that all of the um, uh, GFP is present, excuse my pointing, uh, in, the in the complex here that is the D398A complex. This is free GFP that has been released from the complex. What you see is that at a short time of 30 minutes, uh, there hasn't been sufficient hydrolysis in cysts to allow ATP to arrive in trans. Hence, there's no release of GFP that is refolded uh, from the cyst folding chamber. Uh, and at two hours, however, the, uh, the story is quite different. Here you see release of GFP fairly efficiently from the cis folding chamber by the addition of ATP. By contrast, non-hydrolyzable analog and ADP itself are unable to mediate in trans the triggering of release of the ligands from the cis ring. So we're talking about an allosteric reaction here uh, where ATP uh, binds in trans and sends a signal across the ring ring interface uh, across a distance of about 40 or 50 angstroms to trigger, or more than that actually, uh, more like 80 to 100 angstroms really if we're talking about triggering the release of GROW-ES polypeptide, here GFP, but also of hydrolyzed ADP from the cis ring. So it's an allosteric reaction that's driven from the trans ring upon ATP binding. 
So the conclusion is that uh, binding to the trans ring uh, of ATP and release of the ligands requires hydrolysis in cis. And in the case of D398A, where hydrolysis is very slow, you have to wait around for a couple hours. In the normal situation, one would wait around for about 10 seconds while the cis ring hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and gates the entry of ATP into the trans ring, ejecting then the cis ligands. So the overall conclusions are that ATP binding really does major work in both the cis and trans rings. In the cis ring, its ATP binding promotes the binding of GROES and of uh, associated with that the large structural uh, uh, changes, rigid body movements of the cis ring, apical and intermediate domains that basically contribute to ejecting polypeptide into the folding chamber where it commences to fold. ATP binding in trans then, gated by hydrolysis in cis, triggers an allosteric ejection of all of the cis ligands, GROES, polypeptide, and ADP. And so really the role of ATP hydrolysis here uh, is simply to advance the machine directionally. So his, cis hydrolysis uh, gates entry uh, into the trans ring of ATP, which arrives at a rate of about 100 per second. Uh, it, and it gates also the entry of polypeptide, which binds more slowly at 5 to 10 per second, as we've uh, published in recent experiments. There, but there have also been publications from Tony Clark's group and others uh, measuring these rates of arrival. And finally, GROES is the laggard, uh, the final ligand to arrive on an open ring with a, a, a arrival rate of about 1 to 2 per second as a rate. Uh, and so this assures uh, efficient encapsulation, the fact that GROES arrives uh, as the slowest ligand to arrive. It ensures uh, ternary complex formation, ejection of the substrate into the cis cavity and productive folding and uh, a new uh, folding active cis ring on what had been the old uh, trans ring. So uh, that is the sort of summary of what I've wanted to say about this system and how ATP acts therein.